is uh, a review of respiratory physiology. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about basic anatomy. We'll talk a little bit about mechanism of breathing, VQ mismatch, oxygen transport, and like gas interpretation at the end. So this will be reviewed for some and uh, or most. Um, but it's an important part of what we're expecting to see. So respiratory system in general is has several functions. So we have a gas exchange of oxygen and CO2 between our inspired air and our pulmonary circulation. The respiratory system acts as a, cir uh, a circulatory filter, clots in air. It has a metabolic uh, function, angiotensin converting enzymes, um, inactivation of compounds, and an immunological uh, function as well. Just a little review of anatomy. The respiratory tract consists of upper airway, airway bifurcations, and alveolar units. So we have a right lung with three lobes and a left lung with two lobes and one lingula. So on inspiration, we create a subatmospheric alveolar pressure. So there's a pressure gradient. So as we inhale, our diaphragm contracts, our accessory muscles assist in lifting the rib cage, and that creates a negative pressure in the chest and creates a pressure gradient between the mouth and the alveoli. So air moves by bulk flow from the upper airway to our terminal bronchioles. It diffuses through acinar ducts uh, that basically lead to our alveolar space for gas exchange. Muscles we use, diaphragm is the primary respiratory muscle in infants and intercostal and diaphragm for pediatric or, or patients that are not in that infant uh, category. The infant chest wall is very compliant, so um, it's less effective in assisting the diaphragm to generate negative intrathoracic pressures. So it may present as a paradoxical breathing pattern under conditions of distress. So when the infant is in distress and the diaphragm is contracting, the chest wall may collapse on itself and that may um, not assist with the actual movement of gas into the lung. So re retractions as compliance de uh, deteriorates and work of breathing escalates up the thorax. So when we're describing work of breathing, we usually describe mild work of breathing with sub uh, subcostal indrawing, subcostal and intercostal indrawing as you move up the thorax would be classified as moderate, and then subcostal, intercostal, supraclavicular, accessory muscle use would be considered severe. So that's a, a good way to maybe just um, extract information from a referring center as well. When they say the baby's working hard and they having trouble describing what that is, so maybe we can use those kind of um, prompts to or descriptors so we can um, extract information and get a better, a clearer picture of what of what they're seeing if they're having trouble describing it. So on expiration, on expiration, it's a passive pro process usually, and it occurs uh, occurs naturally as a result of elastic pro properties of the lung and the chest wall recoiling. Um, an increase in alveolar pressure gradient forces air back up to the mouth. If there's an obstruction or the patient is forcefully exhaling, you may have closure or choke points somewhere along that gradient. And so that's where you get gas trapping. So airway resistance, we'll talk a little bit about resistance and compliance. So airway resistance is um, resistance to gas flow and it's proportional to the airway diameter to the fourth power when you have laminar flow conditions, and the airway diameter to the fifth power in turbulent flow conditions. So when you have turbulent flow, such as the example of forced expiration, you have um, an increase in airway resistance to the fifth power. So, we don't need to get into too many formulas. We have a resistance, airway resistance formula here on the slide. Um, 
I just wanted to kind of quantify adult and pediatric airway resistance and compare the two. So in an adult, you have two to six centimeters of water per liter per second of airway resistance. And in a pediatric patient, it's 20 to 60 centimeters of water per liter per second. So obviously, it's 10 times higher in a pediatric patient, just normal, OK? If you have a specific airway condition or a respiratory condition, such as bronchiolitis or uh, asthma, where you have secretions or an infectious process, that is going to increase that significantly. Right? So we're already 10 times higher than an adult. Compliance um, is a change in lung volume as a result of a change in airway pressure. So as you create that negative intrathoracic pressure, or if we're using positive pressure with the ventilator or a resuscitation bag, every time you give a centimeter of water pressure, a, pressure, a change in pressure to the lung, um, you're going to have a change in tidal volume. And depending on um, how stiff or the, the compliance of the lung, it's going to determine how much tidal volume you actually move. So surfactant helps us to maintain the alveoli in an open position, and it improves this, uh, the compliance of the alveolar uh, self. So again, if we're in a situation where we have decreased surfactant stores or prematurity of a newborn, that's going to impact the patient's compliance. So again, we have a, a compliance um, formula. But let's just look at, at the um, compliance numbers. So you have an adult. The compliance is generally 50 to 100 mLs per centimeter of water change. So for every centimeter of water, the patient will get 100 mLs of tidal volume. In a pediatric patient, it's 60 mLs per centimeter of water change. And that's per 1,000 mLs of FRC. So we usually just kind of have to figure that out because the patient population is so uh, such a wide range. You know, you have five kilos up to 100 kilos. So you have to kind of quantify that. But you see how it drops down from 150 to 60. In a neonatal population, it's two to five mLs per centimeter water change. And in a patient, a neo patient with um, uh, prematurity, it's 0.5 to 1 mL per centimeter water change. So it's pretty dramatic, the amount of um, change in a normal compliance, just normal compliance, never mind an injured or a disease-impacted lung. So just to review the pediatric versus adult, so in re for resistance, the normal pediatric lung is 10 times the resistive properties in that adult. And in compliance properties, the normal pediatric lung is one to two and a half times less compliant than the adult lung. And a normal neonatal lung is 10 to 30 times less compliant. So if we have that in our back of our mind already, we're ready to uh, expect higher peak pressures, that sort of thing. And recognize that we need to supply the patient with uh, exogenous surfactant, for example, in a patient that's premature. So this is a pressure volume curve, and this just kind of is a different um, way of saying what we were just talking about. So we have pressure on the bottom axis here and volume on the vertical axis. So as we apply pressure, we have a lower inflection point. So when we apply pressure, Let's say we're doing it with uh, manually with a Jackson Reese bag or a, a resuscitation bag, and you squeeze in the bag and the chest isn't moving. When it starts to move, that's the lower inflection point. So this is where you start, as you apply more pressure, you see a uh, response of a change in tidal volume going into the patient. So this is the area where the lung is being recruited the vertical axis here where it's climbing. So as we apply more pressure, volume goes into the lung. So we're recruiting. So this is where you would, if you're listening to the patient's chest, you would hear crackles, or you'd hear recruitment. So pop, 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 pop. When you get up here, the upper inflection point, now as we apply more, as we, sorry, I'm using the nose here. As we apply more pressure, we don't see 
a response in increased tidal volume. So this is where we create conditions of over distension. So it's not very productive. So you're applying pressure here, but there isn't more volume going into the chest. You're not recruiting lung volume. So potentially that is an area where you may create lung injury, right? Pneumothorax or uh, volume trauma, barotrauma, that sort of thing. So there's also, uh, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, let me just take a look at here. Okay, there's a pressure volume loop on the next slide. So uh, let's just go to that. So the next slide on your uh, handout, past this one, has a pressure volume loop. And this is a loop that reflects high airway resistance. So as the airway increases, your uh, PIP increases, and there's a change from point A to point B as the loop becomes wider. So here we have an increase in pressure. So an increase in pressure from this point to this point, correct? And what happens is um, the volume doesn't go up, but you notice that the, the, the pressure volume loop here gets wider. So you have higher air resistance that creates uh, a higher peak pressure, doesn't result in a higher tidal volume, but it also makes the um, pressure volume loop wider. Because you have air resistance on the expired, this is the expired limb of the curve. So this is inspiration, expiration. And you see, it takes a long time for the gas to get out. So it's as the pressure drops, pressure drops, pressure drops, it's staying in the lung, and then it drops quickly on this side. So, so like when you guys are looking at the loops on like the Ovia, that's what you'd be looking for? Well, let's say the Hamilton. Because okay. the Hamilton's the one we're going to be taking yeah. with us. That's a good. But, I but I, yeah, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah. But on the Hamilton, we we have the opportunity to make a um, uh, sorry freeze a loop, okay. right, and then kind of give us a baseline. Um, over the course, now you may already have this. May be your first loop, right? Yeah. If your airway yeah. resistance is already high. Right. But as you get familiar with more loops, this is a normal looking loop, right? Um, if it was really skinny, that may tell you that your compliance is poor, and we'll get to that in a second. So when it gets narrower, to speak between the inspired side and the expired side, it tells you that the patient has poor compliance. Because what happens is you get the breath in, and then it slams shut. So the curve is, uh, sorry, the pressure volume loop is narrow. Sometimes it lays down to the side as well, because you have... Um, high pressure, but not very high volume because the compliance is poor. And so we'll get into some of the interpretation of that. But this may be your first one, and if it looks wide and kind of bulky and globular, um, then maybe resistance may be one of the issues. But so the air trapping. Yeah, air trapping. Air trapping and stuff in yeah. this too? Really, really wide? Is that how it would yes. be? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because you have airway resistance, on the expired limb, I'm just going to get to that. As the, on the ex <laughs> no, but you're right. So the expired limb, so it's not coming out, right? Right. And so you may have the next breath coming in before all that volume gets out, before it gets to the baseline. And yeah, so you may have gas trap. So if we're, if we're just, just kind of skipped ahead a little bit, but we're talking about decreased compliance. So as the <laughs> compliance decreases, the bump, the, the lung, the bump. <laughs> the lung becomes unstable and prone to collapse. So uh, it leaves the pressure volume loop narrow and laying down to the right. Now, so this one has a green, the green one here, and it doesn't show up on your, uh, on your uh, paper copy. But the middle one is your normal loop, okay? So we expect to see some distance between the inspired side and the expired side. And every patient's different, so it's a relative thing. But um, if you had increased compliance, you see how it's standing up uh, more vertical here, the, the whole curve itself, because you need less pressure to get the volume in, so it's more compliant. Um, the red one here on the outside, on the, on the far right here, is decreased compliance. So again, 
as you now in this example, it probably should be narrower. Um, but and so the inspired side and the expired side should be probably closer together. And but it does lay down to the right because you're require, requiring higher peak pressures, higher pressures to get the same volume in. And we'll talk about that when we get into um, more discussions about how we're going to ventilate. But normally we're volume ventilating, right? We're selecting a tidal volume. When we're using the neonatal um, system, we're pressure limiting. Right. Okay? So let's start with that. So with the neonatal ventilator and the neonatal system, we're pressure limiting. So we select the pressure and there's a result in a tidal volume going into the patient. If we see with our eyes or with our oxygen uh, sats or our blood gases that the tidal volume is coming down or the chest isn't moving as well, um, that tells us that our compliance is deteriorating because the pressure will be the same every time with every breath, right? So the tidal volume is variable with the neonatal pressure limited system. When we're using um, the Hamilton or the LTV for the larger pediatric patients, we're going to select the tidal volume. And then we're going to see the peak pressure on the ventilator go up or down to reflect our changes in compliance. So if our lungs get stiffer, our pressures will go up. The tidal volume we're going in will be the same every time. And vice versa, if our compliance improves, like for example, uh, if you were giving diuretics or uh, recruiting lung volume in a patient with congestive heart failure, you give them diuretics, they start to pee off some of that fluid, or that pulmonary edema goes away, starts to resolve, their compliance improves. You give in a set tidal volume, and the peak pressure will come down. So oxygenation versus uh, ventilation. So we have alveolar ventilation, which is our oxygenation. <coughs> our alveolar surface area is directly impacts our ability to oxygenate. So that's why we're giving PEEP or we're recruiting lung volume because we want to increase the surface area for oxygenation. And we want to maintain a recruited lung volume. So, you may hear of PEEP, you know, we're using PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. PEEP doesn't recruit lung volume, tidal volume recruits lung volume. So you give a tidal volume, you hear pop, 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 and then the patient exhales. If we don't maintain that recruited lung volume with PEEP, then the patient will de-recruit every time. So, that's why we've got to find what is the appropriate PEEP to maintain that FRC that we were talked about a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was. Um, so we want to maintain a normal functional residual capacity. And I always uh, kind of, my example is like a, a balloon. It takes a lot of pressure to start to get, to blow up a balloon. So if you blow it up and start, you start it, that's your FRC. And then it takes less pressure to create volume going in and out. But if every time that balloon collapses, it takes a lot of pressure to, to get it open again. So our goal is to maintain the FRC with the peak to keep the balloon partially inflated. Now minute ventilation, or, or uh, ventilation or CO2 removal is our minute ventilation, and that's the amount of air moving from the mouth to the alveoli and back. So it's really a communication problem or not a problem, but a communication issue between getting um, fresh gas from the mouth to the alveoli and back again. Oxygenation is the gas transport at the alveolar level and the amount of surface area for that to take place. So the gas moving in and out is tidal volume times frequency. So if we have a high CO2, we're going to either increase the tidal volume or increase the rate. So VQ mismatch, some of the terminology we're going to use when we're uh, out in the field, maybe uh, we may have dead space ventilation or may have a shunt. So we're going to talk a little bit about VQ mismatch. And so VQ mismatch, uh, 
is the broader term that represents dead space ventilation or shunt. And the two variables are ventilation and pulmonary blood flow. Okay, so dead space is a VQ of greater than one. So the ventilation, it's like a fraction, right? So the ventilation on the top, if it's two parts ventilation and one part perfusion, it's going to be greater than one. It'll be two. So dead space ventilation is anatomical dead space, so the trachea and the main stem bronchi where there's no alveolar gas exchange taking place, that's anatomical dead space in a patient. Or if we have, pay, or if we use um, connectors between our circuit, elbows, uh, end tidal CO2, if those are, are high or bigger volume, they're going to add to our anatomical dead space and rebreathing of gas. Alveolar dead space is normal alveoli with no pulmonary blood flow or over distended alveolar regions that are displacing pulmonary perfusion. So, um, let's just let give you an example over here. So, you have dead space ventilation where you have um, gas going to both of these alveolar units, and this one, there's no pulmonary blood flow. So it could be that um, there's a clot, and it's directing, shunting blood or directing blood away from this alveolar region here, and it's going over to this side. Or maybe this alveoli is overdistended and squashing the capillary bed so there's no gas, or sorry, there's no blood flow passing by it to facilitate the gas exchange. So it could be either one. The blood's bypassing it, or um, the alveoli is preventing blood from um, going past it. So in this case, you have uh, CO2 of 40 in the blood being transmitted to the alveolar space, but when, they, when the patient exhales, it mixes, and so your end tidal CO2 is reading a low number. So that's a classic sign of um, you do a gas, let's say, and your gas says the CO2 is 40, but your end tidal says the CO2 is 20. So that's a classic sign for um, dead space. Shunt is the opposite. Can you say that again? Sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. the end tidal thing. So can you just say that one more time? Uh, can you go to the previous slide? Wait, okay, I can go to my thing. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you have um, fresh gas. Right going to both sides, okay? And then you have perfusion going past these alveoli. So this one doesn't see any perfusion. Yeah. This one does. So you have gas exchange, so CO2 of 40 comes from the, from the so if you did a blood gas, it, it would sh reflect that the CO2 in the blood is 40. Right. Right? But because you exhale this fresh gas, and this is half of the gas, right? Uh, okay and this is half the gas, and only half of the gas saw this gas exchange take place, it will dilute it. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, I get And so yeah. then it would be 20. So it's a classic sign where you have a blood gas value, a CO2 is higher, and your end tidal is significantly lower. It tells you that you have dead space ventilation. And now there's purely that would be alveolar dead space? As no. Or either. Could be. Could be. Either. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, uh, I was going to say, it's typical for an end tidal to be lower than your arterial gas. Mm -hmm. Okay? Normally somewhere between 7 and, um, I don't want to make it too wide, but uh, 12 is a normal range for it. To, so, I would say normally under 10, though, okay? So, let's say 7 to 10. Um, and your end tidal would be a little bit lower. But if it's really significant, you may consider dead space. Uh, uh, another. Um, the reason they're lower is because of what you just said, Sandy. There's always a component of anatomical dead space mm -hmm. that dilutes the yeah. gas okay. and, and lowers that end tidal. 
So there's always a component of that. Um, it's just a matter of finding what that is for each patient. And then once you've got a baseline, but if it was 40 and 20, that's a big jump. But this would have to be an art gas to breathe. Yes. Okay. Usually, yeah. Now, if we only have cap gases, there's a reason we, um, now this is CO2, remember, mm -hmm. right? So um, normally we, not disregard, but we don't put a Perhaps <laughs> 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 Oh, okay, I didn't even stand here over here. <laughs> you didn't feel that? My gums are <laughs> My gums are flat. Right here. So, so if we did do a cap gas, the CO2 on a cap gas is fairly close to a CO2 in an arterial gas. And that's why we will will act upon that. And we can talk about that if you can remember that later. Yeah, I just was just clarifying. And yeah. PO2 would be uh, different. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, shunt, uh, so shunt is the opposite. So shunt is where we have less ventilation and more perfusion. So if we were looking at as a fraction of V over Q, it would be less than 1. So the venous blood that is circulating right to left, that will cause a shunt. Uh, bypassing functional alveolar air spaces for gas exchange. So you may have an intracardiac shunt or an extracardiac shunt, and that may be if somewhere in the lung. So this would be, clinically, you would see hypoxia unresponsive to oxygen. So you need to recruit alveoli in this case. So here's our example. So you have blood flow that's passing by both lung units, but one of the lung units is collapsed. Okay, so this is obstructed by secretions and it's collapsed. So you have a CO2 of 40 on your blood gas. You're going to get 40 on your end tidal because that's what's coming back from, from, but it's not very effective, right? Because we could have better gas exchange if we had more lung units that were participating. Hold on a sec. If you're Blood flow is affected. Isn't that the other one? Like, isn't that your you've got good ventilation but you have no perfusion? Wouldn't your intracardiac stuff be? Because this you have perfusion but you have no ventilation, right? So there's no communication. Right. At all. There's no gas exchange at this point. Because this, so your that's net your net effect would be your forty. Then. No, but like if you had like a like a cardiac thing, right? Like if you. How, but you're so you're still perfusing your lungs, or is it because you're missing? You're not perfusing your lungs. Yeah. If you're well, fusing, you are but you're perfusing, but you're not you're not ventilating though. You're yeah, not. you're not getting any oxygen. Like if you think about that, so the one side's adding oxygen, the other side isn't. So you're getting a shunt, right? Because you're getting still. But that's like so say like sick lung reason. Like you have the blood yeah. go. Yeah. So why? That's what I'm saying. Like isn't cardiac? I think you're thinking of a, a defect maybe where. The, um, I'm just wondering how a cardiac defect would affect your actual lung, like lung. Because the blood isn't being able to run by the lungs for those Right, lungs? so that wouldn't that be the last, like the, the... I think what I meant here was Sorry. a little different uh, than what you're thinking. Okay. Um, I think a cyanotic uh, lesion where you have blood going, um, let's say... Uh, like the blood's being shunted away from the lungs, I guess that then yeah. you have perfect ventilation, nothing wrong with your lungs, you're not right. sick. Yeah. Yeah, but it's that's, just going but right that's by what we were just yeah. talking about, yeah. where you'd have the but dense space moment. because there's no blood. Yeah, you're Whereas right. this would be more like... You're right. I, probably, to, I should probably... Uh, sorry, I'll, change, I'll change this But your blood so is still flowing to your lungs. It's just yeah, it's mixed. Saying, so it's, it's yeah. not this. That's what right? I, that's you still have a complete perfusion. I know what you're saying. I'll change that. Sorry, do you see why I'm confused? Yes. I see why you're confused. And I don't want to get everybody else confused. Yeah, uh, I'm confused now. Well, because yeah, now because <laughs> in this one your blood is isn't the problem; it's your actual lung that's right. the problem. Right. Right. But in a cardiac, you're like that's what I'm saying. The, the cardiac wouldn't cause the the lung problem. The the cardiac is the blood problem, so it's the last one that we were just talked about. Or it's your perfusion, not your ventilation. I think what I was trying to get at is. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> I know. Where the, where Can you explain it a different way? It's similar to a, a cardiac lesion where. Uh, the blood goes past the lung and it doesn't get 
uh, the, there's no okay. gas exchange. Right. Okay. So I, I, I can change, I'll change the slide next time okay. so that it's clear, but that's what I intended um, there, that it, it's similar to a cardiac shunt that bypasses the lung. Okay. It's still a shunt. It's still a shunt. It's still yeah. a shunt. Yeah. It's just a yeah. different. Yeah. yeah, one's a cardiac shunt, and, and this yeah, one's an exactly. example of an intra, intrapulmonary shunt. Uh, intra Which I get. I just, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, maybe do a diagram for the cardiac and one for yeah. the pulmonary. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I was giving two examples, and I only gave them, uh, this, this is the intrapulmonary example. Okay? Yeah. So, good question. Good to clarify these things, because it's... It is something that I wrap your head around for a bit. So again, here you got CO2 of 40 on your blood gas, and then you'll have an end tidal CO2 of 40 because this is the only one. It's not diluted by the other, like on the other example, it was diluted. This side, there's just no gas exchange. So what we're going to try and do here is we're going to try and recruit more of these lung units so that we can um, um, improve the effectiveness of our gas exchange. So oxygen exchange, no, we don't need to get into this. <laughs> Dalton's law, um, total pressure of gas mixture equals the sum of pressures of individual gases. I just wanted to uh, put this on here for information. But you have total pressure, and then partial pressure of CO2 and water will influence it. So due to normal VQ mismatching, your arterial PaO2 is less than your alveolar PO2. So if you think, oh, I'm giving 100% oxygen, my PO2 should be, um, or my, al uh, my arterial PO2 should be a certain amount, it's always going to be lower because there's CO2 and, and uh, water vapor that is kind of um, taking up some of that. Um, we also have oxygen content, so carrying capacity. So hemoglobin impacts our oxygen transport, right? So we always need to keep an eye on that, and we have that in our blood gas uh, analysis. We have hemoglobin, so we need to make sure that our carrying capacity is optimal. And this is an oxygen dissociation curve, and just to give you an idea, and they referenced this in a, in a previous lecture and talked about it a little bit. So you have an oxygen dissociation curve. Um, here's your oxygen saturation on the vertical axis, and your PO2 on the um, horizontal axis. So as your, sat, as, as your PO2 goes up, your sats go up. And usually we're up here somewhere. So anything around 90% is usually a PO2 of 60. Now, it'll shift your curve right or left, depending on certain conditions. So if you have an acidosis, for example, so you have a higher CO2 or a higher hydrogen ions, which is an acidosis, then the, or so the oxygen affinity at the hemoglobin level, it wants to release oxygen, okay? So when you have high temperature, increased DP, uh, DPG or acidosis, it will try and release uh, oxygen from hemoglobin and distribute that to the tissue level. When you have an alkalosis, or decreased CO2, decreased temperature, there will be a higher affinity for oxygen to hemoglobin, and it will be more likely to hang on to that uh, and not distribute it to the tissues. So it's just something to keep in mind. So carbon dioxide transport diffuses easily across, across the alveolar membrane. What happened? What's DPG stand for? Sorry. Um, yeah, I can't remember. It's higher in newborns. Um, is it like a blood? Yeah, it's a blood thing. It's a, it's a. I believe it's, it's a component of hemoglobin. Yeah, it changes the energy of hemoglobin for oxygen. Yeah. What's that? Higher, higher levels will make the oxygen attached to the hemoglobin. But it's not something we can't test for. No, we can't test for it uh, on, our, on our blood gases or anything like that. Biphosphoglyceric acid. That's what I thought. 
<laughs> I don't know, yeah. sorry, I just, it, yeah, that's a good question. I should know these things because if I'm going to put it on the slide. But usually 2,3 DPG is something that's higher in the newborn period and it has a higher affinity for oxygen to your hemoglobin. That's really all you need to know. So, um, so the newborn are more predisposed to hanging on to the oxygen, not distributing to the tissue level. Okay? I guess the acidosis was lower than acidosis. Yeah, because the increased DPG shifts it to the right where it releases oxygen. Right. I feel hemoglobin. Yeah. Increased DPG. Okay, I said hold on to it more. Yes. So acidosis, it releases it to the tissues more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's I thought it's the same as the DPG. So DPG, if it's lower, you have a higher affinity. So those arrows are backwards. No, 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 no I was right. What he said was backwards. <laughs> 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 I'm going to own it. I'm going to own the DNA. I should just take that DNA. Right, that's <laughs> just <laughs> It came with the slide. Honestly, so, we don't. We don't talk it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah. It's just yeah. because more like your gas, your temperature. Your yeah, the thing we need to focus on is our acidosis and alkalosis, right? Like what I always learned was um, for the curve, like the normal and the red, and then if you run to the right and you go to that lower pH curve, then um, the way that it, that it was explained to me to remember is that when you go for a run, your temperature increases, you get hot, um, your CO2 will go up because your metabolism is increased, and um, you'll get a bit acidotic that too and like you know you build up lactic acid in your muscles but your body wants like it needs to release the oxygen to the tissues more so it has a lower affinity to hold on to the oxygen tightly so that was like that was easy way for nice. me. So really good good. Yeah. 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 really good good teamwork sure. thank you yeah. 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 that's the best way to do it so where you really can visualize what's happening, and it all kind of fits together. The DPG is coming out. <laughs> yeah, I should just yeah, mention that. that. When the newborn is going for a run, this is what happens. Thank you for the training. Thank you for that. I don't remember how it works. <laughs> okay, so CO2 transport. Um, so CO2 has a higher affinity for hemoglobin, and so it diffuses across the alveolar membrane quicker. Um, so, our arterial CO2 is largely determined by our minute ventilation, so that's our rate and our tidal volume, and it influences our acid base status or the pH associated with um, our organ health. So, arterial blood gases, let's talk a little bit about blood gases. So normally we want to have a pH between 7.35 and 7.45. There are buffers that minimizes the change, minimize the changes in pH under conditions of excessive acid or base, and their monitored buffer is primarily uh, bicarbonate. So let's talk a little bit about um, is the patient <coughs> acidotic or alkalotic, right? So the normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. Um, our goal would normally be to have a pH of greater than 7.25 to maintain organ perfusion. So there will be situations where um, we, d we are not targeting a normal pH because in order to do that, we're going to have to um, maybe ventilate the patient aggressively and maybe create lung injury. So we may accept permissive hypercapnia, a higher CO2, and a lower pH in order to um, prevent other uh, potential injury. So when I look at a blood gas, I look at 740, and I think, is it on the acidotic side or the alkalotic side of that? So the acidotic side would be anything less than 740. And then I'm going to look and see whether my CO2 is elevated or uh, is my bicarb low for an acidosis. Or if it's alkalotic, it's greater than 740. I'm going to see is my CO2 low or is my 
uh, bicarb high. Or a combination. But basically, that's how I'm going to start my um, categorization. So, and then we're going to look and see is the patient compensating appropriately or is there a mixed picture. So, an acute situation, you would have, let's just do an example, um, and I'm making this up as we go. So, if our CO2 is 7, uh, or sorry, our pH is 7.5. 3-0. So is it acidotic or alkaline? Acidotic. acidotic. And now I'm going to look and see if my CO2, is my CO2 high or low? Is my bicarb high or low? And my, I want to make it real. So let's say uh, my CO2 is 55. And my bicarb is 24. So we have an acidosis, right? And we have a high CO2, and our bicarb is normal, right? So that's an acute respiratory acidosis. Because your bicarb hasn't shifted to correct yet. Correct, right. Okay. If, if my bicarb was a little bit higher, uh, let's say my um, the bicarb was 30, and my pH was 7.35, mm -hmm. and my CO2 was 55. Or that would be a partially compensated yeah. respiratory okay. acidosis. Now, chronic changes, 